Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to yet another edition of the Liberia History Channel on Focus on Liberia. My name is Dennis Jai, and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. In tonight's edition of the Liberia History Channel, we are continuing our Presidents of Liberia series. And today we are looking at President William V. S. Tutman. President William V. S. Tutman. As a modern Liberia president, right? We've been doing with the old guys. Now we're coming to chat. All right. And we are glad to be back after two weeks being away on sabbatical or, you know, we're, we're having some. <laughs> Has it only been two weeks? Okay. <laughs> yes. Spring, spring time. So we're happy to be here. Carl, welcome to the show. It's always my pleasure to be here and share all of the wonderful discoveries I make about our history um, with all of the viewers. All right. Today we are talking about President Tutman, President William V. S. Tutman. Yes, we are. It's exciting, Carl, you know, Bob, because we have people watching us who actually live through that era. And uh, let me, full disclosure, the year he died, that's the year I was born. So I was born in, uh, I was born September. When did he die? In, in November, we'll get to that. <laughs> so you carried a man out of the world. You push him out. Okay. Right, but, he was only 75. <laughs> see? He was only 75 years old. So we want to welcome all our viewers from across the globe. This is the Library History Channel where we talk history. I was in a group today and somebody said, oh, you know, the most educated presidents are Tubman, Tubba, and President Salif. I say, have you watched the History Channel? Say, no, I don't <laughs> watch it and you'll learn more. People well, just say things, right? They just talk. They just yeah, talk. Yeah. And, and it's interesting. So we're going to be talking about William B. S. Tubman. The, the funny thing I was reading, uh, uh, people were saying, but he was the youngest man ever elected to the Senate at 28. I mean, they just make these outrageous claims. You write them, you know, even write it down in books and publish it um, as if they know that the ages of all the people who had ever been elected to the Senate since yeah. the country's uh, independence. You know, it, it's, it's, we make some claims. Uh, but are you going to ask me about my shirt? <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. I said, no, let me zoom in on that shirt. Wait, wait, let me get my, my locks out of the way. So, the Leadership Academy, I see B A I O, I see Save the State. Tell me about it. So this is a collaboration project with the uh, the BAIO and the and STS. Uh, we started a not-for-profit organization called the Liberia Legacy Foundation, the BAIO Liberia Legacy Foundation. And the first project that we're working on, we're going to do some historic restoration projects of some historic sites in Liberia, but. Most importantly uh, is the Leadership Academy, which we've already started the groundwork. Uh, we'll, we've hired a couple of staff on the ground and started the training. Um, so education, education, education. It's, it's about um, the Leadership Academy is a mentorship program. It's not an actual school, not yet, uh, but it's a, it's a mentorship program that we're starting up that's going to be uh, teaching young Liberians about ethics, oh. civics, um, and all around good citizenship, how to be a good citizen. What does it mean to be a citizen? We're gonna teach them about the constitution, their civic rights, their civil rights and responsibilities, um, about the importance of volunteership and the, also the importance of self-determination and problem solving skills, critical thinking skills. There are many professional Liberians, African-Americans. Um, we've got uh, uh, Michael from Haiti. We've got, it's an international, effort of African people in the African, Pan-African diaspora that are going to be impacting knowledge, um, sharing what they know with these young people. A lot of them are professionals. We've got engineers, we've got doctors, um, people that have uh, backgrounds in environmental science. We've got me, public policy, <laughs> um, and you know, different things uh, that we, we're going to be sharing with these young people. But the first step right now is training the the mentees the facilitators that we've hired and it is it has uh, been wonderful uh, getting to know the new facilitators and uh, if you want to participate in the process in the pro um, project 
If you want to help donate to the project or volunteer your time, let us know. And there's always room, there's always room for more. So um, right now we're just very, very excited, very excited about um, about this. I am super excited about that call. And if, if we, we just got to do a show because I have so many questions coming to my mind. I see DIO, <laughs> what is that? I see Save the State, what you do. You said restoration, what are you going to restore? Are you going to go to Dudwekan? Because right there, there is a Jesus footprint on the Manic Creek. Yeah, well, <laughs> so I mean, so there's a lot. We're of gonna questions. we're gonna try to identify um, historic uh, projects of African importance. You know, how they have historic sites of, of world importance. There are many historic sites of African, global African importance in Liberia. Many of our heroic uh, Pan Africanists are buried in Liberia. Many of them have homes. Um, that have been dilapidated in Liberia, graves that have been neglected, vandalized, uh, things like that. So there will be some restoration projects, but really the in initial emphasis right now is this uh, leadership academy, this mentorship program that we call an academy, which is uh, going to be free for young people who attend. We're very, very excited. Um, it, it's one of those things where everybody... It's like, oh, you know, this is complain, complain, complain. Well, how do you solve the problem for the future? You start yeah. with the children. So because you said um, something very important. You said you're gonna teach ethics, you're gonna teach civics, what it means to be a good citizen and all that. A I mean. responsible citizen and teach, you know, not only your your rights as a citizen, but your responsibility. Right. Because you know, your responsibility right so to much. the country and your, your community, how to be a good citizen. Yeah. We talk about rights so much until we forget responsibility. Yes. So that, that's so. good. I look forward to hosting the team so that we can talk more about it. Very interesting. Oh, that would be great. That would be yeah. great. Thank you Thank so you. much for the work for BIAO and Save the State and you. And, uh, yeah. Shout yeah. out to everyone with BAIO, um, our MD, Basabari, uh, Holup, Mark, um, everyone, AMA Cassell. Uh, uh, oh my God, James Kuhn, <laughs> the whole crew, Adam, Dr. Adam Dole, uh, uh, Pote Chroma, um, so many people. God, please forgive me. I can't think of everybody's name off the top of my head. Uh, uh, Say, um, everyone that is participating in the process, Morrison, uh, who's one of the, the, the recruits, and uh, a sister, Lovely, and uh, this guy, uh, Paul all of them that are participating. I just want to say a shout out to you. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Yo, thank, thank you. Balika, Imama, Nietzsche, <laughs> Tato. All right, today we're going to be talking about President William V. S. Tatma. Carl, I'm excited about Tatma. You know, from the start, I mean, we started from Joseph Jenkins Roberts, and now we are at President Tatma. That's been yes. an exciting journey. This sure. has been this has been an exciting journey, and I hope that you know um, we might even do like a children's book series or something. Um, Tata Miata Fondula suggested that. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful um, suggestion that she made. Um, yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna grow this, you know, to the leadership academy and everything sure. else. But President Tubman. Um, his story is long. <laughs> he right. served the term. I always joke with, with, with my friend Bill, his grandson. I tell Bill, I say, your grandfather served the term of about five presidents. So, you know, his story got to be broken down small. Yeah, <laughs> yeah his story is long. So today we're really going to focus on his background, um, the, the little bit of genealogy I was able to um, unearth. And we'll kind of talk about those details. Um, we'll skim over his his, his uh, political legacy, and then on a subsequent episode, we can get deeper into his politics and policies and achievements. But today, I want us to focus on the things that people really don't talk about much with President Tubman, which is who is this guy? You know, right. you know who is this guy? He, he look, he, you know, he looks like he looked to me like a gribble man. You know, but mm -hmm. was he actually gribble? And 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 you know, who was he? Where did he come from? Um, and where did his people come from, and how did he come from Maryland? That's the story we're going to tell today. Oh, I, I can't, I can't wait. You know, in my, <laughs> in my, in my town, 
uh, president is synonymous to Tadma. So if you are speaking my language and you say, I want to be the president of this organization, you will say, I want to be the Tadma of this organization. Yes. So that's, and this is a newer term, right? For a general, because Tadma has not been there that long, right? So that's, so all we know, when you say president, the name that comes to mind is Tatma. So really, I'm excited. <laughs> Who is this man? Yeah, some of us, some of us were born uh, during during Tubman's time. Some of us were born during uh, Talbert's time. Some of us were born during Dole's time. Um, there are, uh, you know, people born after that and so on. Um, I was born during Talbert's time. Uh, but I do know a lot about Tubman because my parents clearly were born during Tubman's time. So they had a lot of experience during those periods. So many of our parents um, were of age, came of age during the era of President Tubman. So when they talk about the good old days when like grow was sweet, you know, even if you wouldn't endure that Tubman time, they could be talking about. Yeah. Not Charlie King. No, no, not Charlie King time. <laughs> <laughs> Some time the jobs were rolling, you know, schools were in, you know, people had opportunities to go to school and, and, and money was flowing into the country. The question is why? You know, how much money was coming out and how much was flowing in? Um, what kind of line, fine line did President Tubman have to walk? We'll get into those in a subsequent episode. But today I really want to talk about the, the man that his friends and family affectionately referred to as Brother Shad. Brother Shad, the 19th president of Liberia. And, and, and because of that history, because when I was in grade school, we used to say he was the 18th president because at that time, Liberia was missing one president. So we thought he was the 18th, only to realize that he was 19th later on. Oh, because they skipped over Smith, James yes. Kirby Smith. Yes. All right, so let's get started. And if you are watching, please uh, share the show. I published something today on uh, Facebook has have a uh, restrictions on our views. They call that limited feature. And it's, we don't know how long it's gonna take, but when you share the show and invite somebody, that will go a long way for people to know because a lot of people are not getting our notification when we go live. So please uh, share the show, invite a friend. This is by far one of the best show you can watch. <laughs> in Liberia, in if we do say Liberia. so ourselves, <laughs> yeah, because all other shows they teach is is most of the shows you see the odd noise. Here is history that is never been told anywhere in Liberia. You know, I can say this with you know authority because I went to school in Liberia up to college, <laughs> and I was a very good student, so I knew a lot. So if I tell you this, was these things were not taught during the time I went to school. That is true. And I've been able to compare notes with other Liberians. So let's get started with Brother Tubman. Yes, yes, Brother Shad. So he served. He served from January 3rd, 1944 until his death on the 23rd of July, 1971. So uh, again, we're focusing on his background. If you've been watching the History Channel, um, you know that we like to get in. I like genealogy. I like to know who people are. Well, who are your people? It's a common thing we like to ask in Liberia. You know, I go somewhere, I'm among people. Who your ma? Who your pa? You know? Yeah. Um, I noticed that a lot, even as a grown woman in my 30s moving to Liberia, I would go and I would interact with these older women in the town, and that would be the first question. Who, who, who your ma? Yeah. Oh, yes, I know your mother. You know, and the question, because if you didn't know my mother, then, then what? <laughs> but it, it, it's a cultural thing we have. We really, because we come from all of these different um, types of people that have come together to make a country, it becomes an interesting story to explain who your people are. And because everyone's story is so different, we really are not a homogeneous bunch. And uh, Tubman's story, if you compare this to the previous presidents, um, though he, of course, was born in Liberia, his grandparents, his grandparents were born in bondage, they were born on a cotton plantation uh, in Georgia, in Augusta, Georgia. Um, his paternal grandparents is what we're focused on the most right now. 
So the Tubman story begins in, I mean, 1837. Now, when I say begins, I'm beginning the story here. It does not mean that, of course, the story is even older than this, right? But I'm mm -hmm. beginning the story in 1837 when his paternal grandparents, William Shadrach and Sylvia Tubman, repatriated to the colony of Maryland through the state, Mar uh, the state of Maryland Colonization Society. Um, before being freed, as I said, they lived on a cotton plantation in Augusta, Georgia, which is about two hours from where I live right now. Um, this for me is extremely, um, it was a bit emotional for me. Um, for one reason in particular, there's still cotton fields around Augusta, Georgia. And uh, when my oldest daughter was looking for, for, for colleges to go to, uh, one of the schools we went to was in, was in Augusta. She so didn't end up going there, but I remember driving to these different schools. The guy didn't want her to leave the state. I wanted to stay close by. Um, we went to these different schools and we would pass these cotton fields. That are still, there's still cotton fields, right? But now people get paid to, and they have, you know, machines and stuff like that. But um, the air of bondage, the the, mm -hmm. the uh, eerie feeling is still there. And it still struck me um, as we, we would pass these things. And people just drive by them like it's normal. I guess I'm a bit sensitive because of my mind always being connected to history. Um, I feel things when I see these kinds of scenes and it takes me back to things I've read. Um, the torment, children as young as two years old being forced to pick cotton with their hands in these fields and it gets very hot in Georgia. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Hmm. Dennis. The servants of Emily Tubman of Augusta, Georgia and Mr. Bayard of South Carolina experienced cotton planters whom the society was desirous to obtain as colonists. That they might introduce the cultivation of this staple and some servants of Mr. Weather of Frederick County, Maryland, but who were resident in Virginia and who went out with Maryland servants of the same master. In all these cases, the full cost of transportation and support in Africa was paid by the respective owners, besides a handsome outfit which they gave to their people. In the case of the Tubman servants, who formed almost the entire expedition of the Baltimore, the result of the voyage was a profit to the society, as will be seen by referring to their balance sheet, where there is credited to the brick Baltimore the sum of $7,618. Yes. So Emily Tudman was the wife of the rich plantation owner who was to inherit all of his wealth. And one of the things that he did was he um, emancipated some of his, his human property in his will upon his death. Not while he was alive, but in his will. He only emancipated some of them. And he left his wife, Emily, with a lot of money. So when Emily sent these people back, one of the reasons that they were desirable was because they had the skills in cotton. And these colonization societies, as we have discussed thoroughly in previous episodes, were really also economic ventures. They wanted to grow agricultural products and also export and profit from them. So these projects were a bit of an investment. My understanding from this was not just that Emily was, she was smart. Emily was significantly younger than her husband. She was a lawyer. She, well, you know, she was a lawyer. Her brother was a lawyer. And they understood that the way the single crop, you know, growing tobacco or this cash crop uh, uh, industry or, or uh, um, uh, this cash crop uh, uh you know, producing cash crops for profit in the South with forced labor with, with enslaved human beings was not going to last forever. It's the 1830s, 
abolitionists are gain, gaining ground. You know, there's a lot of issues. The northern states are industrializing. She's realizing things are changing. So some of the things that it did, and from reading newspaper articles and opinions, court opinions of the time period, I, I'm starting to believe, or I, I want to believe, that the motivation for these people going back with this money was that they wanted these people to be workers, laborers on a cotton plantation that they were going to form in Liberia. Yeah. And the Maryland Colonization Society was going to directly benefit from this. So you're sending these skilled cotton workers and they're going to train the indigenous people, work with them side by side to grow cotton efficiently and effectively as they did in the South. They're going to be compensated in a very minimal, you know, just nominal compensation. So it's almost like sharecropping. They're barely being paid. And that was really what this was. So they send all of this money with them. And you would think that this money is for them to start their own private venture. Mm -hmm. But it ends up being that Maryland is the one really controlling the resources, as you'll see in a, in a subsequent slide. Do you have any other questions that this uh, uh, brings about? Right. I mean... Anyway, when we go further, we'll see. Because you were saying that this was business. It's not so much that. I, so I'm giving you this money. Go to Liberia, make farm, and send me back the money. Was that a deal? The money, because she has now she's vested in the colonization side, right? So they ha it had investors. Right. These people that were donating money, they were expecting returns on their investment. This was an economic venture. And let's talk about so Richard Tudman, lit of Richmond County. Let me blow this up so we can see it. Died tested in the month of November 1836, leaving his wife, Mrs. Emily H. Tudman, his soul, you know, that a female executor, so ex ex executor, right. right. <laughs> that a female one, not the male yes, one. Yes, yes. <laughs> Richard had left a gift of 10000 to the University of Georgia on the condition that the legislature permit his estate to free all of his slaves. The legislature refused to accept this gift that would allow free slaves to live in Georgia. With that option gone, Emily began to investigate places where she might help her slaves settle. In the end, she offered them the choice to go and settle in Liberia in West Africa or continue to work for her in Georgia. Roughly a third chose to go to Liberia and Emily equipped them fully, arranging their travel and continued to support them for a time. In Liberia, they took the name of Tutman and their farming community Tutman Hill prospered. Emily Thomas Tutman died in 1885 at the age of 91. So this is the narrative that the Georgia Historical Society pumps about Emily that, oh, you know, she wanted to, you know, Georgia didn't want the slaves to be because you couldn't be a free and black in the state of Georgia um, in 1836. You couldn't be free and black in Georgia until after the Civil War. If you were a black person, you needed to be property, you needed to get out of Georgia. So Emily could have given them the money and sent them to Maryland or some other northern state, New York, Ohio, which was very safe at the time for freemen. But she chose to send them to Liberia. A third of them decided to go to Liberia. You're going to go to Liberia, you're going to work there. I'm going to set you up, help you build houses and everything, but you're going to run this plantation for me, for uh, Maryland Colonization Society. And you're going to turn a profit. You're going to train others to work on this plantation. So this was, you know, this was a kind of, you know, um, pretty, you know, smart economic business move on her part is what I'm starting to understand from looking at the records. But what I presented here in this slide is what the, the, the official narrative is. Now, this is a sketch of Emily when she was young. And for a woman to be a lawyer at this time in history too was in an apprentice lawyer, not, you know, didn't actually go to a real law school, but apprentice because her brother was an actual lawyer. So she studied under her brother and was very, very um, astute and understood many things. 
um, for for a woman of that era. Mm. Now, in consideration of the unlimited confidence that I have in the discretion of my good wife, Emily H. Tudman, I do hereby constitute and appoint her as my solo executrix of this, my will, with the full hope and belief that she will use every means in her power to carry every part of this, my will, into complete effect. I therefore desire that she, immediately after my decease, apply to the legislature of the, states to, of the state to pass a law, if they, in their wisdom, should deem it expedient or politic, to enable her to emancipate and make free in this state all the Negroes I may die possessed of, except Anna and all her children, Charlotte and all her children, and Fanny and all her children. So I did some research on these three people because I wanted to know why he didn't want to free Anna, Charlotte, and Fanny. These were his concubines. These were the women that he owned that worked in the home, cooked his food, and that he had children with. And then the question becomes, why in his death would he not want to free his biological children? And so this is a question I don't have an answer for. I mean, we can speculate. Maybe he felt that they would be safer on the plantation, on his property, than out in the world where people were not treated well if you had African heritage. I don't know. It's shocking. Yeah, right. Anna, Charlotte, and Fanny. And they look like beautiful so, women. The names... Look like they were beautiful women too. <laughs> so the people that he did free were the field hands. The people he did free were the ones who were working on the plantation. Right. So when this man structured his will, he knew that there was going to be an end to this forced labor thing. Maybe he foresaw a future where Anna, you know, Charlotte and Fanny's children would be able to actually inherit something in Georgia. I don't yeah. know what he was thinking. Right. There's no way for us to know because he didn't write it down. He didn't write his motivation down. He just did not want them to be released from their obligation to the plantation. And he didn't say that they are part of my family now. Absolutely not. You couldn't say that because that, that wasn't legal. Oh, you can't yeah. say, you know, it, 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 you can't have, I mean, they were human chattel. Even if they, he was having children with them, the children themselves were his property. The brick Baltimore. Yes. Yeah, so this is the, the paternal side of the Tudman, of the Tudman family. There were 55 people that were repatriated in May of 1837. Now there's a lot of books that claim, a lot of books that claim that Tudman, the Tudman clan was repatriated in 1834, I've seen. I've seen 1836 more often. Many, many books written on this have it absolutely wrong. I have double checked numerous primary sources, newspaper publications, the Maryland Colonization Society records, the records from the port at Baltimore in Maryland, the brig Baltimore sailed for Liberia in 1837. So the Tubman clan did not arrive in 1834 or 1836, it was 1837. And I'm saying this with absolute confidence. Uh, multiple, multiple primary source records from the time period corroborate what the Maryland Colonization Society records also say, which is um, it left the Port of Baltimore on the 17th of May, 1837. Mm. Um, I think some of the confusion may be because of the year Richard died in 1836. That might be why people think that they left that same year, but it is not accurate. Now, 
there were 55 people who were sent on this brig. Most of them were from the Tubman plantation. Now, if you see here, there are many people with the last name Cummings. Mm. And there are a couple of people who carried the last name Jones. Now, carrying the last name Tudman did not mean that you were related. Mm. It meant that you were coming from the Tubman plantation and you chose to take the name Tudman. So they could be some family members, some people who are just from the same plantation. They're just taking the name Tubman because mm. they were owned by Tubman. We're taking Tubman. All of them were illiterate. Because in Georgia, when you're in bondage, especially if you were a plantation field hand, you were not allowed to read and write, to learn how to read. It was against the law. You could be lynched. You could be hung from a tree and killed for learning how to read. These are the names. I underlined this person, um, Dashwood Tubman. He was supposedly uh, 27. Now, sometimes their ages were estimated. Yeah. In this particular case, Dashwood Tubman was supposedly 27 years old. I want you to keep that in mind. Keep that at the back of your mind. President Tubman said that his grandmother's name was Sylvia and his grandfather's name was William. And that they were on this brig Baltimore, he said 1836, but it was actually 1837. Why is this important? These are all of the names of all of the people that were on the brig Baltimore in 1837. There were two people named Williams, I mean William. There is a William, Tubman, who was 45 years old. There was a William Jones, who was five years old. There's only one person named Sylvia, and at the time, she was two years old. Hmm. So that couldn't be Tubman's grandmother. It could be. She's, she would have been. This is a so Tubman. She, she's old enough okay. to have been Tubman's grandmother. But I'm just saying she was two years old. And William Tubman was 45 when they arrived. Hmm. So by the time. And William Jones was five. Did he switch his name to Tubman? Was he also from the Tubman plantation and changed his name to Tubman? Was he adopted later on by a Tubman and then changed his name to Tubman? Because the name Tubman itself was an adopted name. Right. So there's a lot of room for speculation here. Everyone following me? Yeah, interesting. Because uh, according to President Tubman, you say, his father was, his grandfather was William Tubman and his grandmother was Sylvia Cummings, right? Yes. His so grandmother say, was Sylvia. He never said she was oh, Sylvia Cummings. Okay, he just yeah, said she Sylvia. was Sylvia. Right. And you're saying, okay, the William Tubman on this uh, ship record is 45, William June is five, and Sylvia is two. Yes. So it's, so it's possible uh, William Tubman, 45, could marry or could have a child with... It's also, it's also possible that William Tubman, the 45-year-old, marries Ethelda Jones and adopts her children. Yeah. Interesting stuff. This is the ship record. Or yeah, so it could be five-year-old William could be his grandfather, or very you know creepy, forty-five-year-old William could be his grandfather. I don't know. 
but that's something to explore. Right. It's more likely, it's more likely that William Jones, who in this description um, does not have a father. I mean, you've got George Jones from Charles County who dies shortly thereafter the arrival. So maybe William Jones is then adopted. Who knows? Does he take on another name of whoever's sponsoring him to go to school? Who knows? So I just wanted to throw that out there that it's not clear. Yeah. And there's not enough information to draw a conclusion. But what I underlined here in red, Dashwood, it's spelled on the uh, Colonization Society records, on the ship manifest, really. And remember, they couldn't read and write, so they wouldn't be able to spell their names. You know, if he calls himself Dashwood or Darkwood, we don't know. So if you go to the next slide, and here he, it says he's 27 because his age is approximate. And this is in 1837. So three years later, they're claiming that he's 26-ish, right? They're saying he's yeah. about 26 when he dies. And now they're calling him Darkwood Tubman. I can see that happening. If you can't read, you can't write, people just yeah. calling your name Darkwood, Darkwood, Darkwood. Doctor Show, you know, they just, okay, this is how you spell it. It happens to this day. But yeah. just to show the age approximation and the, so the Maryland Colonization Society was not as meticulous as some of the others with paying attention to some of these details. But you got, you know, Darkwood, he dies um, from frontitis and, you know, um, three years after his arrival. Should have been 39, but he's 26 here. Maybe he was only 23 and they approximated his age at 27. Who knows? Because if you don't have a birth certificate, they right. will just look at you and call your age. And then maybe upon you know the ship record, somebody's just writing when he dies, maybe then his family said, no, he was 26 years old this year. You know, the death record is usually a little bit more accurate because now the family is coming forth and telling his story where some guy just writing down, this is this person's name, you know, and, right. and so on. And it's possible that, you know, this is more accurate. A death record would usually be more accurate than a ship manifest because a ship manifest is just people, some guy writing stuff down where a death record is the family people saying, this is who our child was and he's gone. So he probably was 26 and he probably his name was Darkwood. Um, I wanted to also go down to the birth records. Okay. So you've got in the year 1840 and 18 from November to November, 1839 to 1840. Um, Mrs. O. Tudman gave birth to a daughter that year. And they don't give her first name, but her husband was Osman Tubman. And what's interesting about this, Osman was, they documented him as being 50 years old when he arrived. You know, mama's baby daddy, maybe. <laughs> so he would have been about maybe 53. And, you know, 52, 53, he's having a baby, a daughter, supposedly. Then you have in the next column I underline uh, Mrs. C. Tubman. This is Cyrus Tubman, who was 48 years old when he arrived. His wife is also giving birth to a daughter that same year. So these Tubmans are not necessarily related to each other by blood. Some of them are brothers. Some of them are not. Some of them have no relation whatsoever. This plantation, they were buying people from other states, from Kentucky, straight off of slave ships. So some of these people were actually born in Africa, taken into slavery. If you look at the plantation records of Richard Tudman, he was one to buy slaves directly from the auction block in Savannah at the port of Savannah, Georgia. So enslaved Africans coming from Savannah, because he had this huge plantation, he would then go and purchase them and bring them to his plantation. 
up until 1808, he was doing these things. So some of these guys who were born before 1808, some of them were actually, you know, enslaved in Africa and brought over. Many of the people that were working on the plantations were mixed up like that. African born enslaved people and generational African Americans who were on the plantations as well. So these Tudmans are from, not from the same, necessarily from the same family. While some of them are related, they were not all related. I cannot overemphasize that enough. Right. Same Tudman. As long as you were on that plantation, your name, your last name is Tudman. Right. And some of the people that were on the plantation did not take the Tudman name, but most of them did. So upon so landing at Cape Pamas, they settled at a farm named Mount Tutman and in a section of East Harper, which later became known as Tutman Town. Here, the young couple tilled the soil and raised three sons, Alexander, William Shadrach, and John Hillary. Yes. So... Mrs. Shadrach Tudman gives birth in 1841. Mrs. Jacob Tubman gives birth also, and also Mrs. Benjamin Tubman gives birth all that same year. So these Tubman people coming from this plantation and they're 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 having children, they're making babies. And they're 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 populating they're populating the soil with with these beautiful children, and out of these births comes the father through this line of Shadrach Mrs. Shadrach Tudman comes his father Alexander. Um, I believe that Alexander was born first. Um, I could be wrong, but I believe Alexander was born first. I think um, this could be his birth record. So, so Shadrach gave birth to Alexander. Tubman. Mrs. Shadrach Tubman, yes. But so these I, are they don't so the the time period this is how European Christian culture worked. Women were an extension of their husbands. So you won't even see their first names. It's my wife, Mrs. My, this my person. Wife would be Mrs. Dennis Ja. Yes. And nobody is going to know her name. It was very few prominent women who asserted themselves, like for example, Mrs. Richard Tudman, who was the um, executor of the, her husband's estate. We knew her name because she was one of the rare educated, you know, lay lawyers, really. She had, she couldn't be a real lawyer, but she learned law from her brother, tutelage supposedly. So she asserted herself and people knew her name was Emily. But if you look at a lot of wills, they don't have time for that. I mean, it's just very wealthy women. Once they inherit property, then you know their name. But this was typical to just write Mrs. This and Mrs. Mrs. That. And, and so we, we, we're we assuming that Mrs. Shadrach Tubman is Mrs. William Shadrach Tubman and that this is uh, Sylvia. That is that is the presumption. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the most likely case. All right, so when we were discussing the economics of this, um, Maryland Colonization Society, this is a balance sheet. This is a balance sheet. And they're talking about all the money they're raising, right? So if you go over to the right, from the government farm at Mount Tubman, they have raised $2,130.25. That's a lot of money back then. Yeah. So she sent $700 with the people and they're able to produce, by 1841, they're producing over $2,000 a year with her 700 is a more dollar investment. And I have a, you know, 
this is a good this is a good return yeah if i could give 700 dollars and collect two thousand dollars every year you know whatever the equivalent of that is in modern currency that's that's amazing that's a good return and they're multiplying they're having babies yeah public farmer of kip Thomas uh, made a lot of money yeah. So this is when we, the, I hope it's all bring some of our past discussions home about this idea of why you had Daniel Bashir Warner in later years saying we are not going to <laughs> allow these people they call it they call it the closed door policy. So Tubman's open door policy was a reaction to Daniel Bashir Warner's closed door policy. Daniel B. Warner was saying, if you are not a black person, if you're not an indigenous person, if you're not a repatriated African or a recaptured African, if you're not a Liberian, you will not own and operate plantations because agriculture was the thing. So their policy in those early days of the Republican party of Liberia because Daniel Bashir Warner was a Republican of Liberia, their early policy was, as the constitution stated, to encourage indigenous people into agriculture so that they could control these massive plantations that these colonization societies were running and they were working on under the auspice of these colonization societies. So when Liberia became liberated in 1847 and self-determinant, which is why that marks that year marks the birth of our country. The idea was, hey, we are going to control our own farms. So written in the 1847 constitution is a provision for our indigenous farmers to be given the skill necessary to control those farms that they had previously been working on for the benefit of these colonization societies. So the closed door policy, as it's negatively called, was actually very sound patriotic economic policy. And if there had not been a trade embargo as a retaliation, it would have been successful. But as you remember, what came out of this was what? They stopped trading with Liberia. So Daniel Warner, President Warner and others had to create their own ships literally build their own vessels and conduct their own trade intercoastal trade these are the stories that our people need to know yeah. <laughs> about why our economy was the way it was but this is this is some of, of the stuff that happened wow all right so so this colonization society they were actually so the money that was made from this farm was sent to maybe Emily through the, the society. Right. Or reinvested in all those kinds of things. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, the picture didn't come through. That's odd. Okay. Well, well at least the words are there. All right. So William Vekanarad Shadrach Tutman was born at Harper, Liberia on November 29, 1895. His father was Alexander Tutman, Speaker of the Liberian House of Representatives, Senator and Methodist Minister, a descendant of early settlers who came to Liberia in 1834 from Augusta, Georgia. So I, I put this quote in here um, because this is the official quote in many, many books. Okay. You see the same thing repeated repeatedly. <laughs> but as you can see here, it says 1834. And the photo I had actually was the, the, the book, but I'm sorry, it's not, it didn't come through. So 1834, it really should be what year, Dennis? 1837, correct? Yeah. So I just wanted to, to show that, that this is how some of these errors. So one person makes an error and everybody cites that error and it just becomes, it becomes a narrative. So if you even look at any books written in the 20th century forward, you're going to see that they went there in 1834. But if you go back to the primary sources, it's 1837 consistently. There's no mistake. There's no confusion. 
So I don't know who first did the 1834 thing, but just like this, this other things that we've been saying, hey, this is inaccurate. Um, once people start saying something, everyone just picks it up and repeats it without question. Hmm. His mother, Elizabeth Rebecca Barnes, came from Atlanta here, Dennis. She's from our area. Okay. And she went to and she went to Liberia with her family in 1872. So there's a book about the Chattahoochee River movement to Liberia. So that's from people from Georgia and Alabama who went to the whole Chattahoochee, Chattahoochee River Valley migration to Liberia um, from uh this area mostly to Maryland. Um, it, it's uh, it, it, there's a wonderful book about this also. But he, his mother was his mother was actually born in the United States, and mm -hmm. a lot of times, if you listen to Tubman's speeches, you can hear that he clearly sounds like somebody from the South. And if your mother that brought you up has that accent, there's, you know, you're going to pick that up too. I mean, he get a small Maryland gribble accent, but you can always hear that, you know, his mother was, was, was African-American. She was born in the United States and went to Liberia as a, as a young, as a young person, as a child. Hmm. Tubman is writing now. My grandfather, William Shadrach Tubman the first was beaten to death by tribal people because when visiting one of the towns, he found four or five tribesmen tied together for the ceremony of administering Sasewu, a trial by ordeal by which accused persons are convicted or acquitted of dealing in witchcraft. He walked into the group, kicked over the bow of Sasewu and tried to prevent them from administering the concussion. He was beaten to death. Yes. So his grandfather, the father of his father, died when his father was still a child. And we all know, even in this modern era, if you grow up without a father, it's very difficult because especially in an era when the fathers were the providers, sole providers, men were the sole providers at that time. In most cases, women didn't know how to provide outside the home. So if you lose your husband, you're thrust into poverty, usually in those days, uh, because women were typically, again, not working outside of the home. And if they did, it was voluntary. They were not typically paid. So William's father, who's often confused with President Tubman, didn't get to go far in school because he didn't have a father. So he didn't, he had to drop out of school because he was fatherless and, and hustle to take care of himself and his family. Next slide, please. So Alexander Tubman dropped out. Hmm. Yeah, you hear a lot of times people say, oh, President Tubman went to only fourth grade. Oh, he was not educated. And they say all these things that really it's his father. That they that they, they they're confusing with him yeah. is what I've I've discovered. I'm like, you know, why are they saying that about President Tubman? This guy went to divinity school and you know he studied to be a preacher. Why are they saying yeah. he didn't go to school? It's because his father didn't go to school and they don't know the difference. Tubman, that pastor. <laughs> he was actually yes. Yeah. They call they called him a lay preacher, but because he didn't, um, you know, in those days you couldn't just go to seminary school. You had to be ordained and all these things, but. He was on the road to becoming a pastor when he switched and became a politician. Okay, so President, we are probably following his footsteps to be a preacher, but that's another story. I think all of them were, yeah, were following James Briggs yeah. Payne. <laughs> President Payne was, 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 um, he had a DDS. But okay, go ahead, Dennis. Alexander Tubman, the son of William Shadrach Tubman and the father of President William V. S. Tubman was a student at Mount Vernon Episcopal School when his father was killed. Young Tubman was forced to quit school then because he could no longer afford his studies at the school. He soon found employment as a mason's apprentice at Tubman Town. After completing his apprenticeship, 
he moved to Harper City and started his own business. It was during his sojourn in Harper City that Alexander was converted to the religious teachings of the Methodist Church by a well-known Labyrinth revivalist, Amanda Smith. And shortly after that, he became an ordained minister. His great success in his religious endeavors soon led him into politics, and Alexander Tudner eventually would devote three decades of his life to politics. He would serve for many years in the Labyrinth House of Representatives, eventually attaining the position of Speaker of the House. Still in 1872, Alexander Tudmer was a bachelor. This was but this would but this would yeah this would soon change. Yeah. So this is taken from our Greenwood's uh, public uh, publication from 2021, the presidency of William B. S. Tudman, which I read for this presentation and uh, some other subsequent presentations I'll be doing. Um, so basically, his father was an extraordinary person. This is a man who grew up fatherless, was not able to go to school, had to drop out very young, and still was able to find his way to, to be a, a pastor and to also go into politics and serve the people of Maryland County in the legislature. Because by the time he got into politics, Maryland had joined the Republic of Liberia. So Maryland had now become part of the Republic of Liberia, and he was able to serve as a representative from, from Maryland to Liberia. In 1872, Elizabeth Barnes migrated with her parents to Liberia. Nathan and Martha Ann Barnes decided to settle in a small town in Maryland County by the name of Philadelphia. They remained in Philadelphia until the uprising of the Gribble tribe in 1875. The Gribble's uprising resulted from a dispute with the Labyrinth government over territorial boundaries. In the ensuing violence, the Gribbles raised and destroyed the town of Philadelphia, but Elizabeth and her parents managed to find refuge in Harper City. It was in Harper City that Alexander met and married Elizabeth Barnes in 1894. William V. S. Tutman, the first of their eight children, was born on November 29, 1894. So Alexander was an older guy getting married at this age. He was much older than most people were in those days when they got married. And here he's having a son, and he was in his 50s. When his son was, when his first child was born, he had seven more after this. Mm -hmm. So William's father was 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 an elderly man, by in comparison to people who start families, um, right. and especially in those days. So, so if you notice on the other slide, the record of his birth was around 1841. Now he's getting married and having his first son in 1894. So this uh, age is just a number, and let's prove, <laughs> and let's prove that. <laughs> it's like 53. So his wife clearly was significantly younger than he was, which I think was typical at that time period as well. Yeah. So William attended the Cape Palmer Seminary, earned a degree in theology at Cottingham College and Divinity School. This is President Tubman now. Yeah. Admitted to the bar in 1917, he began to practice law in Harper. From 1919 to 1922, he served as collector of internal revenue for Maryland County. For a short period, he taught school and then served with the Labyrinth Militia, rising in grade from private to corner. A candidate on the True Week ticket, the party in power since 1878. Tutman was elected in 1923 to the Labyrinth Senate for a term of six years. He was re-elected in 1929. Yes. So I jokingly say the only time Tutman was actually elected to office was when he ran for the Senate both times. <laughs> Where he was legitimately, where we can not, you know, hands down say that this man actually was elected. 
So I don't believe he was elected to the presidency ever. But that's that's I have my reasons for that. We'll get into in future uh, subsequent things. But um, but he serves he serves his country well. And even as a senator, one of the things that he did, which I thought was really important, the True Whig Party had been taken away, the leadership of the party. There was still overwhelmingly, you know, a lot of uh, African Americans or descendants of African Americans in the Senate. I mean, in the True Whig Party. But the True Whig Party had been overwhelmingly, because of Daniel Howard's father, had been overwhelmingly taken over by indigenous educated people, descendants of recaptured Africans, people they call Congos. So the True Whig Party had really become a Congo party, meaning that it was not really in the, the, the people who were in charge and control of the party, the standard bearers had not been descendants of African-Americans since Arthur Barclay took over as a president. All of the subsequent presidents, including Arthur's nephew, Edwin, were either recaptured Africans indigenous, as in the case of Daniel Howard, or they were from the Caribbean, from Barbados. Tubman is going up the ranks to this party and he is identifying himself with the Congos, the people that are coming from the Caribbean. He's identifying himself with the indigenous people from the hinterlands. He is one of, I am not the typical you know, African-American guy, look at me. I'm short, I'm black. And then he started making jokes and, and inferences about this. He was a tremendous fan of J.J. Dawson. A tremendous fan of J.J. Dawson. Dawson was his greatest hero in Liberia. It was even Dawson that was the catalyst for Tubman to become a politician, as I will show you shortly. You can go to the, to the next slide. This um, this is a, a photograph of the um, one of the dwelling houses of the school that Tubman attended. This was this was taken in 1866, but it probably didn't look much different from this in the early 1900s. So there's probably 40 years or so, um, 40 some more years before Tubman attended that this photo was taken. I just wanted to put a very old picture of the school up. Yeah. But this is, you know, so just look at the structure. This is from this picture. Um, if you can see the inscription at the bottom, um, this is from 1866. Yeah. And, and before that, we saw the campus of uh, Cottetum Institute in yes. Cape Palmas. Yes. So After this... Before you read, I just want, sorry, before you read. So the leeway from the other discussion we're having about him being mentored by Dawson, here's a picture of the Liberian Supreme Court at the time. And as we all know, Justice Dawson was an indigenous Liberian. He was uh, first indigenous, as far as I know, the first indigenous Liberian to be vice president of the Republic of Liberia. And J.J. Dawson was also, as far as I know, the first indigenous uh, person to be the chief justice of the Liberian Supreme Court. And J.J. Dawson was someone that Tubman looked up to tremendously because he was born in Maryland. So he was a really a hero of Maryland County. So after the Supreme Court recessed, Chief Justice Dawson returned to his home in Maryland and shortly thereafter paid a visit to the circuit court in Harbor City. It was while he was at the Stackard Court that Chief Justice Dawson made the court aware of recent decisions of the Liberian Supreme Court. He yeah. requested that someone come forward and read for those present in these decisions. William Tudman and they are being selected to perform the service. Yeah. So what happened was um, somewhere around 19, um, uh, somewhere around uh, 19, Oh God, what year was that? 1916. There was a group of Gola uh, uh, bandits, gang members, I would like to in modern terms, who used to go and raid the, the settlement, 
Because if you remember from watching other episodes, in Monserrato County and others, you still had people living autonomously and separate, living near but separate from the 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 uh, the settlement, the, the established and controlled part of the Liberian government. People still living their kind of traditional lives. So they would go and they would raid these 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 uh, communities in the night. They would just go grab their guns, literally grab their weapons and go and raid and rob people. And then they would retreat back into the areas controlled by the chiefdom. The Liberian government, then the, the, the Secretary of the Interior put pressure on the Gola chiefs and said, you have to turn these criminals, these bandits over for prosecution. And the Gola chiefs were like, we don't know where they are. They're not with us and I in our towns, you know, we, we would not support criminals being in our towns. We don't know where these people are. So they decided to hold the chiefs in custody, almost like in hostage as ransom until the bandits could be turned over by the Gola people. So this case went all the way to the Supreme Court and Joseph, um, J.J. Dawson said, no, you cannot hold the chiefs in custody for something that sovereign, independent human beings did. They have nothing to do with this. I mean, today in modern times, this is common sense, right? right? But in those days, that's the kind of way that they would execute justice. We're going to hold the, your big man until you can bring these criminals because Oh, it's just a group of grable people. So when one grable person does something, they all did it. So we'll punish all of them. That kind of mentality. And, J and JJ Dawson said, no, this is not justice. It's ridiculous. Free the people. And no more is Liberia going to hold tribesmen responsible for the behavior of other tribesmen. I want you to think about that for a moment. This is Chief Justice Dawson a man of justice. This is a real lawyer. This is a real legal luminary of his time. Because even in the United States of America, if one Native American did something, if one Black person did something, the whole Black community was punished, right? right. That was the norm. If in New York or Boston, if an Irishman did something, the whole Irish community was punished. Here you have a Liberian indigenous legal luminary saying this is injustice. People have to be held individually responsible for their acts, not their communities. You cannot punish communities for the acts of people who come from among them. I mean, I wish we had known this in the 1980s. But this is a man, J.J. Dawson, Chief Justice Dawson, saying that release the chiefs. We're not going to do this anymore. This is no longer acceptable in the Republic of Liberia. I mean, Tudman thought that this was brilliant. He so admired this man. So when this man went to Maryland and, and he was explaining to, because Dawson was from Maryland, so he would go home to Maryland every now and then. He had his farm there. He went to Maryland and he said he was going to share this with the people. It was young Tudman that he had come up to read because Tudman was so eloquent when he spoke. So those in said, my can I read? Can I read the, the ruling, my ruling that I laid down? And Tubman read it. He was so inspired. Because that was revolutionary thinking at that time. It was normal to blame if, if Dennis Ja comes from Didikin and he does something, we'll go, we'll burn his town. Maybe not mm -hmm. burn his town, but we'll punish his town. We'll blame the people that from the town for what Dennis does. That was the thinking coming out of the 19th century into the 20th century. That was the way the world functioned. This man was ahead of his time. J.J. Dawson was a true legal luminary and Tudman recognizes and was therefore so inspired from this very moment, he decided he was going to go into law and he wanted to be in the Supreme Court like Dawson. He wanted to be in the Supreme Court like his idol J.J. Dawson. 
Next slide, please. So, so more about Clark, his career. Tedna served as a recorder in the Maryland County Monthly and Probate Court, a tax collector. Oh, this was the Zacchaeus that time, teacher, and has corner in the citizen militia. He joined the True Work Party and began his career in politics. In 1923, age 28, he was elected to the Senate of Liberia from Maryland County. The TWP was dominated by Congo and educated indigenous at the time. Todman jokingly referred to himself as a convivial cannibal from the down coast hinterlands. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> it's, not even, it's not even funny, Tadma. <laughs> but do you remember the Turek Party was 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 dominated by educated native people, Congos, which are the recaptured Africans, and then these 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 people from Barbados and stuff like that. So they were like, you know, trying to assert themselves that this is not only a, a, a an African American descendant thing here. We are, you know. So this idea that the progressives have that we're in the 70s, they, 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 they're, they're wrong. <laughs> they didn't come up with this in the 70s. In fact, this happened at the turn of the century. And it was more successful and more productive than the, than the destructive con conduct of the 1970s, the anti-Liberia conduct of the 1970s. It was so positive that now you have a man whose mother was actually African-American saying in a joking way that, hey, I'm, I'm a native man. Tubman so hated the phrase of Miracle Liberian, which was not even created by African-Americans, but was imposed upon African-Americans by anthropologists in the period, referring to them as Miracle Liberians. Tubman said, no, we are not no Miracle Liberians. We are Liberians, period. He was one of those where you had Charles D.B. King, who was not a Miracle Liberian, proudly walking around, pumping up his chest, calling himself a Miracle Liberian. Here you have Tudman, whose mother was actually African-American, refuting this thing about being a, a, a miracle Liberian and saying, no, I'm just Liberian. We are just Liberians. So his joke about being, you know, a convivial cannibal from the down coast, you know, hinterlands, because this was what they were saying about the Grebos and the people on the Ku coast and the crowd and the, and the, and the crime and the, 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 this is what they were saying. This was, oh, these are cannibals. So he said, me, I'm from these cannibals. Since they're cannibals, we all cannibals from Maryland. So it was a political statement. Whatever you call my people in Maryland, that's what I am too. And this made him very, very, very popular in his county. And people listened to him. They saw him as a protege of Dosen who they adored. People listened to him. So even though he was clearly from his genealogy an African-American, his understanding and his um, connection, he did not separate himself in any way, shape or form from the people that he was raised among. Right. And was this was this political because he tried to do that? Because even as we saw in the uh, 1970s, there were some you know American Liberians, Congo, who were turned their native side so that they would be part of that uh, progressive uh, uh, activist. Was, was this something similar? I to mean, what we're doing? Everything we do related to politics is political, right? It's a political party. The True Whig was a political party. It was being dominated by people who were not descendants of African Americans. But this man was clearly sincere in his sentiments. He was a protege of J.J. Dawson. He was, and Dawson, as you know, was an Africanist to his soul. He was a member of the UNIA. He was a Pan-Africanist. He was centered in his Africanism. He was a nativist. He was about indigenous empowerment. Dawson was an indigenous man's son, an indigenous woman's son. J.J. Dawson was an indigenous man. So if your hero is this very political indigenous person, 
clearly you believe in this message. And look at Tugman. Clearly, he was African. So this idea that it's some kind of pretense is nonsense because there are indigenous people who were very anti-indigenous. So ideology is not the property of your biology, it's the property of your mind, of your thoughts, of your belief system. Ideology is not the property of your biology, it's the property of your mind. So in his mind and his understanding of the world, he saw himself correctly so as an African because that's what he is. He doesn't look like a white guy to me. He doesn't look like an Asian guy to me. You put that man in Ghana, you put that man in the village that your, you were, your parents were born in, you put that man in Nimba, nobody will know that he's not from there. So at what point do we stop trying to look for reasons to de-Africanize Africans? Tetman had become a distinguished preacher or a distinguished lay preacher and was selected in 1928 to represent Liberia at the Quadrennial Conference of Methodist Church Meeting in Kansas City, Missouri. Tetman returned to the Senate in 1934, but resigned to accept an appointment as Associate Justice of the Liberian Supreme Court, a post he held until 1943. So it was Dawson who had recommended Tubman to the Supreme Court way back. And watch this young man, he said, he should be on the bench one day. And so he was appointed by who someone who ended up being his, his nemesis but he was appointed by Edwin Bakri, the court, and he served as, as Associate Justice to the Supreme Court until he was um, installed in 1943 as the first, the first modern dictator on the African continent. Hmm. That's a whole new story. <laughs> The African Development Bank and the OAU. Yeah, so so two two of I mean he did so many things, and I said we're going to have a subsequent episode about his accomplishments. But this this man is a complex person, and we're gonna he he walked a line. Tubman walked a very fine line, and I think his thoughts were that the future generations, if they could maintain some semblance of sovereignty, the future generations would achieve the goal of becoming Liberia because Liberia has always been a work in progress. And I think he, he knew that he had to give up a lot to Western imperialism to avoid being destroyed and still leverage this and hopefully he, he was thinking that if we have more schools and more education and more of this, our country, our children, those of us who are alive today, his dream was that we would be the ones that would then remove the shackles of economic control, foreign economic control. He didn't feel that at that time, Liberia was powerful enough to release those shackles. And even Evan Barkley knew that when they had gone to to meet with President Roosevelt in the United States. They knew the game was over. They could no longer do the heroic things of Edwin Barkley and, 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 and Daniel Howard. They couldn't do those things anymore. They would just snuff like we out if they tried it. So there was some kind of like, okay, we really got to sell out, but we're going to, you know, and Edwin was riding Tubman in the beginning. Hey, my man, we're just doing this thing so that we can stay alive a little longer. Our children will come but we got to keep the torch light to pass it on to them. 
And they felt at some point that Tubman was no longer carrying the torch of Liberian sovereignty. So they started fighting him. They felt that he completely had sold out and forgot the mission he was on. You know, um, that's debatable. We'll talk about that on the next the next uh, episode. We'll talk mm -hmm. about, you know, what was my, maybe in his mind. This is a postcard. Um, Tubman was the master <laughs> for marketing self and propaganda and all this kind of stuff. This guy knew how to market himself. He was a genius. At it. Um, this is this is a postcard um, from his second his second inauguration. <coughs> I just thought it was nice. So. During the 1950s, Liberia had the second highest rate of economic growth in the world. By the time of his death in 1971, Liberia had the largest mercantile fleet in the world. The world's largest rubber industry was the third largest export of iron ore in the world and had attracted more than US 1 billion in foreign investment. Tudman died in London following post-operative complications from prostate gland surgery at the age of 75. Yes. And um, there he was, the first, the first, um, the first dawn of Africa, everyone else emulated him after, everyone else. I mean, if you look at Mobutu Sisiku, everything he tried to do, he tried was a weak and pathetic imitation of Tubman. Um, most of these people who came after him were weak and pathetic imitations of them. Um, Robert Mugabe, all of them, they tried to dress like him, they tried to wear a hat like him, they tried to carry this out like him, they were not able to. So there it is, the story of Tubman. I have a few more photos, um, archival photos of Tubman. So they, this, these pictures were taken, and these are actual uh, photographs that were taken at Mon in, in Monrovia. Um, yeah. His vice so president. That, this is Gussie Vincent. These are Gussie Vincent photographs. That um, this is another photo of Tubman in Monrovia. You see Talbert there. Talbert was big at that time. <laughs> yeah, and then you've got this is the back of the photo. I'm sorry, I said Gussie Quasi Vincent. Tracy Vincent, and then you've got, so that's the back of the photo that we just saw. And that's the last slide. So we've got a few questions here. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I hope it's how can you participate and be part of our <laughs> Library Leadership Academy. <laughs> I hope that's the, yeah. I hope that, I hope that's the question. <laughs> well, this one. Come from Sean Williams. Was Harriet Tubman related to the Tubmans in Liberia, or was Harriet Tubman from that same plantation? No, Tubman's last name Tubman was her husband's name. Um, let me see some questions. There are a lot of comments, but I want to look for the questions first. The various colonization societies, right, writes Dr. Edison Pajibo, in Liberia st stopped operating with the formation of the Commonwealth in 1839. What happened to the mother of the colonization societies in the States? What became of them even after Liberia became a state? ACS continued to operate after Liberia became independent. They were still extracting resources and finding ways to monetize their relationship with the U.S. government and the recaptured Africans. They were doing plantations. They were doing all kinds of investments. They didn't stop. They didn't stop trying to economically exploit Liberia. 
We're talking in fact, about they continue to take money for recaptured, uh, repatriated, recaptured Africans even after um, independence. They were still doing all kinds of things. Okay, Dr. Padu also corroborating what I said about Tottenham being the 18th president. He said, all the exercise books I use have the inscription or picture of Tottenham as the 18th president and President Trevor has the 19th president. Is James Smith's stuff a reality? Some yes. explanation needed, please. Yes, so James Skirving Smith was the, um, he, he was the vice president to, uh, to E.J. Roy, to Edward James Roy. When Edward James Roy was murdered, was assassinated through a coup d'etat, Roberts tried to take over and the legislature said, no, we have a vice president and the constitution is greater than you, Mr. Father of Liberia, Mr. Roberts, you got to step down and let uh, uh, the constitution says that Smith is the president. So Smith served out the rest of E.J. Roy's term before Roberts became president for a second time. So Roberts then became the seventh president of Liberia. And then he basically appointed his successor, which was James Briggs Payne, who then became the eighth president of Liberia. So both Roberts and Smith, I'm sorry, both Roberts and uh, um, Payne served as president twice. Twice. Not consecutive terms, but twice after the overthrowing. So the Republican Party, which was the party of Roberts, J.J. Roberts and James Briggs Payne, um, lost power with the fifth president, which was E.J. Roy. E.J. Roy was an overthrown. We had two Republican presidents and then we had a true Whig party president. So why up to you, my days in, uh, in Dr. Padjibo's day in school, we were, we were doing that. Were the true Whig party then want to remember their own president? Because I know that part came from the Tadma era to say he was the 18th president. Why, why were they? Because the, 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 the people who were structuring our education system didn't care. They didn't care. And they didn't care enough to be accurate. They didn't care. They didn't care about us learning anything of any importance. Whenever you have a situation where your people are being educated by people who don't respect them as human beings, imagine our education system is being created by people who come from places where Black people cannot sit on the bus with them or drink from the same drinking fountain or sit in restaurants with them. They're going to Liberia as Peace Corps people, as missionaries, and they're coming from segregated Southern states. They don't care if you learn anything about your history correctly, because they're not teaching you to be a competitor with them. They're teaching you to go work at one iron mine or to go work at Firestone. They're not educating you so that you can solve your own problems or respect yourself or respect your history or understand your legacy. That's some of the things that got us where we are. They want to they teach you basic, this is how you read and write. They don't even want to give you the practical because mm -hmm. they don't want brilliance to evolve out of the population. So the education system we had was really dumbed down. And it wasn't even, and when I say dumbed down, I don't mean that disrespectfully. What I'm saying is that it was intentional. It was done because, and it, 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 we can't say, oh, we're only doing this to indigenous people because we all went to the same school. So even the children of the rich and powerful were getting this kind of education. Tubman's children were being taught that he was the 18th president. Tubman himself thought he was the 18th president because he went to these mission schools too. They were telling people, in fact, the, the effort to, Mr. Pajabo, the effort to skew like ruin history is not accidental. These people were saying that we had our first five presidents were mulattoes when they had their photographs and knew they were not. And they had contemporary descriptions of them, which called the greatest, I mean, the whitest looking president they draw is James Prince Payne and this man was not mulatto, but they draw him to look this way. They draw E.J. Roy to look mulatto. They draw uh, 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 Stephen Allen Benson to look mulatto. You know, and so my point here, I'm saying all of this to say that 
for them to not have the order of the presidents correct is a small matter if you look at all of the bigger things that they got wrong. This is a this is a, a, a education system that told like grim people the Matilda Newport story, which is completely fabricated. Okay. So they didn't care. That's why, that's why they didn't care to pay attention to the details. Nobody went to the primary sources and did the due diligence that that they do when they're doing American history or when they're doing something else. That's our job. We're responsible to do our own education system. We're responsible to write our own books. Nobody's going to do it for us. You can't depend on people that hold you in contempt to educate your children. It's, it's wrong. Yeah. So the, 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 the reason that nobody is just no, not paying attention to detail, not caring enough to pay attention to detail. The, the vice per the per our constitution, he was the nineteenth president, and per the facts. <laughs> so, so when President Weir got in office, there was a dispute, whether it was twenty fourth, twenty third, twenty fifth, right? I still remember Dr. Don and the rest of the people came out to set this record straight. Yeah, so and God I bless look. Dr. Dunn. God yeah, bless Dr. Dunn. You know because that's he's a Liberian. That's his job. And he took the responsibility to do it. And so that's what we have to do. This is why you tell your own story. Because you will pay attention to the details. You will tell the truth. You will figure it out. You will care enough to make sure the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Because it's your story. So Massa so, is concerned now. So what do we do with all the first teachings over the years? Throw them why away. Do, why throw them away. Them? Get rid of the, the, the anything that you have. That isn't when you when you replace it with better and newer information, you get rid of the old. If something isn't true, you let it go. You let it go. I mean, I grew up learning a lot of strange things about Liberia. And then when you start to see things that overwhelming evidence of the contrary, rational mind says, OK, the overwhelming evidence of the contrary is most likely the truth. Right. You know, and, and initially I thought that it was just negligence. And I said, well, maybe they just, you know, were sloppy. No, this is definitely, it was, some of this was political and it was intentional. Okay. Intentional disinformation. Uh, yeah, and disinformation continues today. I hear people who have just one show call themselves the biggest platform. You're doing one show. I'm <laughs> so disinformation continues today. You want to watch, you know, variety. Here from Dr. Josh Toto, he said, where did nine years came from for the current Labrinth Senate? Uh, the constitution here now said nine years. I think when we're talking about Tutman being the Senate, that's where he was, he came out. Yeah, the nine years is something that is just very recent. And, um, 1986 constitution. Very unfortunate that we would think elected officials to serve for that amount of time. It's absurd. Two times you're 18 already. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Jimmy Wick said this is eye opening. And if you think this is eye opening and uh, you have some questions, please call the number on the screen 605 313 6004. The code is 791403 pound. Call with questions, comments, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll take that. We have one last picture here that. Uh, let, let me show that picture, uh, the last on the slide. That's Brother Shaw. Yeah, that he's there pictured with um, Mayor Robert Wagner. And then that's Holland Jack. Um, he was the president of the Borough of Manhattan. Uh, that guy was, was ooh, boy. Raccoon, raccoon. So, um, yeah, this is going to be another presentation we do on yeah. Tudman um, about his his uh, anti communist uh, anti Tudman. Where one he would jail you for reading a book <laughs> for reading mm -hmm. because the way that the world was when he was in power it was you know the dawn of the cold war and the middle of the cold war. He stayed there until the seventies until seventy one. Um, they really wanted, they really wanted Liberia to 
be in line. They didn't want socialist movements in Liberia because Liberia was an economic exploit for U.S. corporations. So you couldn't have any um, leftist ideology floating around Liberia. So they helped to coordinate um, intelligence and suppress, uh, you know, the free thinking people of the country and sent many of them to Bella Yala, tribes, uh, Fambula, they did horrible things to suppress the freedom of Liberian people to think for themselves. Simultaneously, Voice of America and their grab and hold on our education system was creating an, a mindset, a cultural mindset among Liberians um, that was very anti-African and very pro-European, very pro-white or pro-Western. So a lot of Liberians were raised under this, this, um, this education system that taught them that the, the reason that they were important as human beings was because of the proximity to Western culture, to America and all of these kinds of things that are very um, damaging to the psyche and the morale of a country, especially a black country. And so those things now that we have in hindsight, especially since the Freedom of Information Act, you can read that these, this was deliberate. They planned this stuff. You know, they planned, you know, the imagery, uh, painting, you know, making all of our presidents look like they were mulatto. It was intentional because they wanted little black children like myself um, and my parents to grow up and think that everything that was great that was done was done by the sons of white men and not people mm -hmm. that looked just like them. And it's an unfortunate thing, but we now yeah. know better because that information is available. And so we need to correct it. We need to correct it and we need to do it now. Dr. Laura Davis, many of the early settlers who migrated to Liberia came from Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina. African-Americans from this part of the United States were mixed African, European, and Native Americans. That that that's a really um, a little bit of an extreme exaggeration. Yes, there were some people who were, but majority of the African Americans who repatriated to Liberia, majority of them were not mixed. This one from Jimmy. Jimmy, thank you. Give us uh, twenty bucks. He said, Jimmy said, it is very clear that we were educated by our enemies. We are still bowing down and calling them saviors. Wake up, my people. Mephi hmm. Deco. I know you missed, you know, you, it's Riverside Pros that you missed. Mephi hmm. Deco said, with all the disinformation regarding our Labyrinth history, how do we even teach our children about all the ones we have learned over the years? Unlearn them. Watch the History Channel and our education. Yeah, I mean, that that's not something that's hard to do. When yeah. you learn, when you learn, when you know better, you do better. You don't say, oh, well, this is how I grew up doing wrong, so I would teach my children wrong. When you know better, you do better, right? I mean, that's 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 why we're human beings, because we think we're, we're functioning. And that as, as long as you think you're growing. And there's no there's no shame in letting go of, of, of wrong thing that you've been taught. You don't want to continue to do something that's that's not correct. Right. You know, that's what education is for. And uh thank God for the Labra History Channel right here on Focus <laughs> on Labra, where these things are coming your way. And, and like uh, the Leadership project. Academy. <laughs> right. Now we uh, an academy is about is established in Liberia that will you know, teach all these things. And we're counting on your support to get these <laughs> things done. And a lot of projects can even come out of what you're doing. It can be children yeah. book. You can translate this in Labyrinth yeah. languages. Yeah. I can volunteer to be one of those for <laughs> translating in Gribble, <laughs> Crew, and maybe Basa or Kran. Yeah. So we can do a lot of things with the information that is here. Yeah. And so there is no reason why anyone should still go on with uh, misinformation and say, well, this is so this is so dear to me, I'm gonna hold it. Matilda Newport. <laughs> I just love the Matilda Newport story. 
I will carry it to my grave. The woman with a cannon, the heroine with a cannon, that, that truth didn't happen. Yeah, <laughs> Who is right. called that can tell us it didn't happen? <laughs> the whole one moved the calendar and blew up with all the tiny, tiny little bits of people. You know, come on. You, you, or you, or, or, you, or you, that EJ Roy, that money bag carried him to the bottom of the sea. Right. Or, or still, you know? Alan Benson was white. Can you imagine? <laughs> Or, or, or Daniel Bashir Warner, they tried they try so much to make people laugh. But I was like, really? Because he was a genius. How could he have been so smart? How could he have been so smart and look like George Weir? You know? They got to tell you that, that he was a son of a white man. Because right. he, was too, he was a genius. He was a genius. Anna Otimo said, thank you, Mrs. Famula. We love you. <laughs> Anna, we love you back. Yes, oh. yes, we do. Uh, Rene said, my uncle immigrated to Liberia from Virginia in 1824, and I find the history of Liberia very interesting. Your it uncle, is. 1824, wow. Maybe great, a great uncle or something. Great, great, great uncle. Yeah. Uh, 1824 could be a great, great uncle. Let me see if anyone is on the line. We have nobody on the line. Call set this up. Where we go from here? So we are going to go to um, the politics of Tubman. So our, our next episode, I'm actually not going to get into, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get into um, the achievements without balancing it out with some of his, his, his uh, very um, sinister tactics. So I'm going to break his presidency up into two parts. So we'll do the first half and the second half, right. right? What he did in the beginning and how it started and how it ended. So we'll do a part two and part three for mm -hmm. us to be able to really thoroughly examine it. Right, it's 27 years we're talking about here. Yeah. So I'll do the highlights in the part two and part three. So this is part one, it's just an overview. It's his background, his you know genealogy um, and, and all of that. So. I, 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 I really like it. And I hope yeah. our viewers will find this that useful as well. Yes. So, Carl, I've been reading the Tubman papers online. Any insight you can offer? Um, inside the Tubman papers is a wonderful uh, repository of information, photographs, letters, original documents, lots and lots of primary source documents there. Um, my favorite thing about the Tubman papers is reading the letters, the, the communications between the Paramount chiefs and the president. Um, those are amazing. I don't really, when I get into history, I don't really like too much of the old personal letters and stuff. Oh, Uncle Shad, this, I don't really read those as much. But the, the correspondence between the Paramount chiefs and the president are very telling, very, very revealing. Um, correspondence, church uh, correspondence, um, Tubman was, was a, a staunch Methodist very um, devout and uh, committed to the church. And so there's lots of communications between church officials themselves, schools. I mean, Tubman papers are a rich source online, no cost. Um, so yeah, jump into those. Um, I don't know if that's what you wanted to hear, but I, I, I think that's a great resource for Liberian history for this time period. Thank, thank you, thank you, Carl. You're welcome. Now, now let's. Um, so we're going to do Tubman in three parts. You and uh, please let your friends know, let your family members know. If you are from Maryland County, especially, please come. Let's hear about Brother Shad. Now we have someone claiming to be your nephew. Michael, <laughs> okay, Michael related to everybody. <laughs> How you doing, cousin Michael? <laughs> Michael, Michael yeah. is related to everybody in like, bro. Yeah. You that's that's Michael Padmore, the people that come behind, come after you when I be when I be easy. Yeah. So let's 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 uh, close and uh, let me get your your closing. Yeah. So, uh, oh, President, we got, we got a message from Jabari. Okay. Uh, Basabari, what's Basabari. up? 
Hey, <laughs> but Jabari, Jabari taught Jabari taught our class today um, for four hours, and oh, wow. uh, this morning uh, he was the 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 facilitator for about four hours this morning. So he was tired, I, so that's why he didn't do this episode with me. It is a a, a labor of love, and um, I just wanted to point that out. He's he's actually. Uh, the, and I mentioned them at the beginning of the show. I can't tell you enough how these volunteers um, taking their time to impact knowledge and information on Liberians, young Liberians, um, is just it's just moving. It's moving. And for me, there's nothing greater that you can do for your country than that. You know, everybody's seeking political power, praising you behind politicians. And, you know, if your politician loses, then what? If they win, then what? What can you do right now with your own resources, your own ability that, you know, with the technology that's available to us to to help to elevate your country to where it needs to be? We are the torch bearers. We are, you know, Liberia has not died. It has multiplied. We are still here. So as long as we as long as we're here, the the vision the vision of Elijah Johnson, of all of these people, of, of J.J. Dolson, of Daniel Howard, of Daniel Bashir Warner, of Stephen Allen Benson, of great abolitionists like Joseph Jenkins Roberts, um, and, and, and the preacher president, James Briggs Payne. These people carry the torch, and we have to remember them. You know, Liberia did not begin in 1990 with war. It didn't become being an anti atheist with coup. The still country story is long, it's beautiful, and it is powerful. And it's the power of like you in history is the reason why it has been buried, skewed, and hidden from you. Because if you know the truth, if you know the kind of giants whose shoulders we're standing on, you will not be subject to bow. You will hold your head up in the presence of anyone from any country. And you will proudly say, I am a Liberian. I am the torchbearer of African freedom around the world. I represent sovereignty of African people, even at a time when we were in chains and shackles around the world. This country, which legacy I carry, I carry not just in my passport, my citizenship, I carry it in my, my ancestral memory. This country represents liberation for African people globally. It's something we should be proud of. We have done great things and we'll do greater things tomorrow, but we have to first know where we came from, but we know where we need to carry this. Um, but I do this and, it, it, you know, stop holding down your head when you say you're Liberian. Lift your chin up. This means something. There's no country in Africa with a greater legacy than this. No modern country, I should say. Yeah. Let's get one caller on the line. That's uh, Dr. Josh Toto. He's the former chairman of the Eula Board of Directors. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Let me say thanks to to be so fabulous for the brilliant information she passes out to us. Uh, I just want to ask for uh, Mr. Fabulous. There was, if I can recall, some, uh, some time ago, during President Eddie Johnson's administration, she did call also on like, Liberia historian to come together to see how better they can rewrite the history of Liberia. I don't know if she has any information about that. And uh, if she has, if what they ended the, that came out of that, uh, that meeting, or uh, issue, uh, and what of it? Uh, our own Dr. Don was part of that. Go. On. Yeah, I, I'm not. You know, I'm not. I'm not uh, able to speak on that. I don't have enough knowledge um, about that. I do know that. Um, I do know what occurred. I don't know whatever became of it. I also know that there's an effort. Um, by Dr. Allen at the University of, of Liberia to try to um, rewrite some of the curriculum for history and civics. Um, and I know that uh, Dr. Dunn is also on that committee and so is Dr. Jacine Carr and others. There's a lot of good people. I think sometimes it's resources that are not available for people to really, I mean, that's, that takes a lot of work to do, to do these things. Um, I am fortunate that um, you know I can sacrifice some hours of sleep <laughs> for research, and I have a you know a great uh, team of people 
who I work with, like like Jabari and 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 many others, um, uh, say you know um, a lot of these guys, uh, James Kuhn and, and others, but it it takes a lot. It takes yeah. a lot, and and you know we have to start as citizens, as Liberians, we have to start doing things ourselves and stop pumping our resources into politicians that go there and don't do the things that we want them to do. You don't realize how much power you actually have individually to affect change. And I think, you know, we need to start leveraging more of our own power and stop looking for saviors, electing saviors and, you know, you yourself, what is it you can do? Get it done. And so um, if you want the, the history to be rewritten, y'all make some calls. President Sirleaf has a foundation. Um, you know, they're doing a lot of good work. If you want that foundation to provide resources to Liberian historians to help revise the curriculum, reach out to them. This is your call. This is your duty. If you want... Um, to work with the Liberia Leadership Academy and help us to make this bigger and grow it. Jump on board. Let's do it. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can do. Uh, we're not powerless, um, you know, in any of this. Even this show, what Dennis is doing on this platform, tirelessly trying to present thinking people with ideas, um, constantly calling upon experts and all of these diverse backgrounds and, and, and visions and things to come in and share their thoughts with Liberian people. This platform is not being driven by any politician. This is a private citizen uh, doing his part in helping his, his civic responsibility to his country. You know, in America, this is like, you know, NPR. FOL right. is the NPR of Liberia. The National Public Radio of Liberia, except it's not being sponsored by the national government. It's a private venture. Where you see your government fails, you step in. We used to have citizen militia, though. We didn't have our army. You know, we used to have teachers that were teaching the church house because we didn't have schools. You got to do what you can do when you can do it with what you have. Yeah. And yeah. Dr. Toto say, how can we join the Leadership Academy? Reach out to me, call Jabari, and we'll yes. let you know. Yes, so it is, it is, it is a, um, there's a lot <laughs> that you can do with the Leadership Academy. So reach out to us and you can, you know, either contribute financially, you can also volunteer your time. There's lots and lots of ways to do it. And Right now, we're in the phase where we are working with our three people that we've hired who are going to be the youth facilitators to work with the young people. Um, we have a lot of work to do with them before we can even start to mentor the young people because the people who are going to be on the ground, they need to be trained. They need to learn how to talk to kids. They need to learn how to help to foster good self-esteem. You know, we sometimes have a culture where we uh, cuss children or yell at them and stuff like that. So we have to read orient the young people that are going to be mentoring the younger children and how to talk to them in respectable ways, language that is going to be empowering and not help to break their self-esteem, but to help to empower them and make them feel good about themselves, That's give them the confidence important. that they need. So there's that part of it. We're working on them with ethics classes. If you are a child development expert and you want to review the curriculum and add to it, please contact us as well. We are working with, with um, professionals who work with children, but um, all of these things are being taken into consideration. But the main focus is to make sure that we're mentoring people into a position where their self-esteem, the self-esteem that they need to be able to solve problems, make good decisions, um, you know, and be good citizens. Uh, if we can do that, that kind of thing will grow. I would love to see this spread across Liberia. I would love to see this, you know, be um, that 10 years from now, most of the children in Liberia will have high self-esteem and, and a sense of dignity and a sense of, of self-determination. That is that is my hope. And that is our hope because uh, the old artists, you can teach uh, old dog new tricks. 
you don't want to wait until someone gets in government before telling them <laughs> and to steal. You have to start teaching their ethics from kindergarten. Yes. So, so that's 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 good. Our young people are kind of learning these things. Yeah, and, and that was one of the first courses was ethics. And 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 if you ask the the recruits, you tell the the, the youth facilitators that we hired, ethics is not something you learn in church or in the mosque. Ethics is not religious morals. It is how you conduct yourself in a society, what type of behavior is acceptable and acceptable and not acceptable. It's, it's a completely different thing. Um, sometimes ethics and religious morals overlap, but then what you think is right and what you think is wrong is not always ethical. Um, even if a whole society thinks something is right, it's not always ethical. So yeah. these courses that they're going through are helping to reorient their minds to think about things differently. And we okay. always talk about corruption in our society. Everybody's like, oh, we've got to jail to corrupt people. One of the best ways to, to prevent corruption is to teach ethics and anti-corruption. You mm -hmm. teach people what not to do. And then if they still do it, then you punish them. But you mm -hmm. can't just say you're going to just punish people. You must have a system, a culture, and a process of teaching people how to conduct themselves in certain situations. What are the expectations? Why is it wrong? It's unacceptable for you to do this in this situation. This stuff needs to be taught. It needs to be ingrained in our minds. You know, and, and then, you, you know, that is the biggest deterrent is education and awareness, shifting the cultural paradigm towards one that's more productive, right? And so once you do that, and then you say, yeah, then we're gonna punish corrupt people. Yeah, of course, now they know better. Now the culture has shifted. And so it's no longer acceptable. But what we have is a culture that promotes this behavior. And so it has to change and we have to start with the kids. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, honestly, Dennis, I want to give an example. I know I'm rattling on and on. Do we have any callers or questions? No, so we, we, we're, we're about to close in the next one minute. Okay. Let me give a quick example of what I'm talking about with ethics and stuff. I know this is about time in, but um, for example, you have a, a woman who will send her child to make a phone call to somebody in America and lie so that they can get money. Yeah. Right? A lot. And then this it happens a lot. Parents will tell the children, you go and you lie, you go take this one, and then we'll get this. You know, <clears throat> so this teaches the child, not the street teaching the child at home, teaching the child. They're learning this in the house, not in the streets. That to get money, it's okay because your own mom telling you, go ahead, go tell your uncle this thing happened so we can get extra money. Go tell this person this thing. And so now the child has developed this idea that when I want something, I should lie for it. Because my mother, not the street oh, my mom not teach me this behavior. Yeah. So this is how it starts, right in the home. And if you don't catch children when they're young and say, hey, it's not okay to, to bribe your teacher or to, or if your teacher say, bring money and I will pass you, you say, no, sir, I wanna earn my grade. These are things that are being taught by the people that are supposed to protect the children, the teachers, the parents. These are the behaviors, the mindset, it's coming from the, the people that are supposed to teach them the correct way to conduct themselves. And so then when they grow up and they do the wrong thing, then we've got the politicians saying, well, we'll just jail them, we'll jail them. We have to work at reversing this trend. It's a lot of work. It's not, there's no easy answer. Um, and any little thing that we can do to fix it, let's do that. Let's fix it. It's fixable. It is. On that note, say thank you so much for the night. I want to thank our viewers for watching next week and the week after, join us for part two and part three. Until yes, then, it's going to be great. Very uh, fiery episode. <laughs> <laughs> Is it you guys are having Mrs. Famula been trying to get in touch with her for a year or so? Oh, so the Fumi Adam, yeah, I took myself off Facebook. <laughs> I told myself, yeah, like grandpa politics was giving me a headache. I'll be back after the elections. <laughs> all right. At this time, we'll close with our song that says, We are all Liberians. Have a good night and God bless you. Good night, right. everyone. Thank you.
Thank you. We all love you, man. Love you, right?